Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7? I want to begin reading, as I said, at verse 13. We'll read down through the end of the chapter. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. The latter part of this passage that I read is what I want to focus on primarily, but not to ignore what goes before it, because I think it's very important to consider this passage in that particular context. But he said, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man that built his house upon the rock. But those that hear these sayings and do them not, they are likened unto a man that is foolish and builds his house upon the sand. And of course, the house that he's talking about is our religion. He builds his hope. He builds his life and his hope either on Christ, the solid rock, or on the shifting sand. And we want to examine ourselves this morning to determine where we're built, where we are building, and where we have fixed ourselves. Are we on the rock, or are we building on sand? So the parable of the two builders brings to a conclusion the most famous sermon that's ever been preached, delivered by the greatest preacher who ever lived. Perfect conclusion to the perfect sermon by the perfect preacher. Strictly speaking, we have here the conclusion uh, in these words, in this parable of the wise man and the foolish man and the houses that they built. It is certainly a parable. We have actually the conclusion to the powerful and searching summation that Jesus had given to the Sermon on the Mount. And that, I believe, begins at verse 13, where we started reading. It is there that he brings 
a great summation. And then he concludes the summation by the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. Two builders, two houses. Notice the exhortation in verse 13. Enter you in at the straight gate because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be, many that go in thereat. So he says, enter you in at the straight gate. And then he says, here's the warning, beware of false teachers. And again, in verse 21, not everyone, everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I believe that these warnings especially belong together with what follows. These things go together. If you have been listening to false teachers, if you have built your religion on the teaching of false prophets, then you have entered in at the broad gate and you are on the way to destruction. And listen, when Jesus said, many go in thereat, mil millions and millions this morning are listening to false teaching. Oh, they might be in a church or a synagogue or some other place of worship, but they're hearing false teaching prophets. They're hearing false teachings and they're entering in at the, the broad gate that leads to destruction. So these two warnings especially belong together. How many have made professions of faith based on wrong teaching and they cling to a false security all their life because they heard a false gospel. And it's not just those that are non-Christian that we're talking about. We're talking about so many that call themselves Christian denominations and Christian churches are preaching a gospel that is strange to the Bible. And they're being believed and people take this false teaching and they cling to it and that is their security their entire life. And many will be just like these that we read of here in the judgment. But Lord, I walked down that aisle. I said the prayer. I did everything that personal worker told me to do. And I got baptized and everything. And he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. So many things that I think that those that have their hope fixed in some, something false, they cling to it and this is their security and they believe it's their ticket to heaven. And they will be shocked. And you can tell here, these are some of the false prophets that have been teaching, no doubt. And as they stand before the Lord, he doesn't say you didn't do the things that you said you did. He just said, I never knew you. A lot of things go on in the name of Christ. Seem, seem like some very amazing things, almost miraculous things. And people say, this is, this is the real deal. But if it, doesn't, if it doesn't measure up to the muster of the Word of God, it's not the real deal. And it doesn't matter who they say is giving them the power to do it. The Holy Spirit gets blamed for a lot of things that he has nothing to do with. So our Lord <clears throat> ended the, the sermon with this parable in which he gives a double analogy. <clears throat> Those who heed the exhortation are likened unto a wise builder. Those who ignore the warnings are likened unto a foolish builder. Oh, the awful, the tragic disappointment 
when those who have ignored the warnings, the devastating collapse of their whole house, everything that they trusted in for their shelter, everything that they trusted in with their souls, and the whole thing comes crashing down. Thankfully, some of these false structures come falling down in this life, and there's time to escape them and get to the rock and start building all over again. This time fixed upon the rock himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the point of the parable is to illustrate the different outcomes between those who build on Christ, the solid rock, and all who base their hopes in mere religion. But this parable also applies to those who profess no particular religion. And more and more we're coming to that. People are just irreligious altogether. But let me tell you something, they are trusting in something. And whatever it is they're trusting in, that is their house. And you can be sure that if their house is not built on the solid rock of Christ, it's going to come crashing down. And whatever they're trusting in, it's going to come to nothing. So it is a very vital question. It's a matter of vital importance that we we hear the message of the parable, that we hear what the Lord is saying. And I want us to first compare the two builders. Start with the two builders, and then we'll compare the houses. But both of these men saw the need to build a house. Both of them. They saw that they needed a place of shelter. They saw that they needed a place of safety. And so, therefore, they saw the need to build a house. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So people need a place of shelter. They need a place of safety. Proverbs 23, 18 says, For there is an end. There is an end to this life. There is an end to this world as we know it. One of these days, the Lord Jesus is coming back and the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat and there will be after that a new heaven and a new earth. But one day this world is going to come to an end. There is an end. Both of these men seem to understand that because they're both building houses. They're both getting ready for it. Man is a religious creature instinctively. You can go to the darkest jungles in the most unreached places on earth and you will find religious people. They may be worshiping a tree. They may be worshiping an animal. They may be worshiping the sun or the moon or something. But they, are, they got something that they're trusting in, something that they see the need for religion, it's instinctive in men. Even the foolish man is not such a fool as to be included in those in Psalm 14, 1, those that say in their heart there is no God. This man that was a foolish builder, he wasn't obviously was not that foolish. He believed there was a God that he was going to have to answer to. He wasn't one who doesn't think beyond this life. He's not one that doesn't let his mind go to that time when the house of this tabernacle is going to be dissolved. And that's going to be hap happening to each and every one. Surely we all realize our need of a Savior, do we not? 
Do you think you can, you can make it without a Savior? There is an end. We better be ready for it. Something else, both men set their hands to the work. They both saw the need to build a house and they both did it. Religious zeal is not lacking, even in foolish men. Oftentimes there is a great zeal. Obviously many of those who are condemned at the last will have been religious. We see that in the, at the judgment where they're saying, Lord, Lord. They were zealous in what they were doing. Surely, Lord, you were impressed with what we were doing. Everybody else was. Very zealous. Paul said to the, the Jews that they had a zeal for God. He didn't deny that, but it wasn't according to knowledge. And so much of religious zeal is not according to knowledge. It's not according to truth. And a lot of it is simply building this false shelter, a shelter of good works or whatever that is going to protect me in the judgment. Some do many wonderful works, wonderful works, and all the while they're building on sand. Now these two houses might have been quite similar in appearance. I have an idea they probably were. After all, many foolish builders are professing Christians. Lord, Lord, many wonderful works. They're, uh, they're building and, and they seem to be building a Christian house. Now judging superficially, the differences were not so obvious. Only God sees the heart. Man looked upon the outward appearance and going by outward appearance superficially these two houses picture them sitting next door to one another driving through the neighborhood might have looked very much alike that's on the outside that's seeing superficially but God sees down below the ground he sees what that house is built upon. He sees into the heart of man. He sees what is really, where that trust really comes from. And if it is genuine Christian faith or if it's something else. Another thing, it appears that both men were skilled and knowledgeable in their building. They knew what they were doing. Now, if I were to build a house in the neighborhood, my neighbors might be getting up a petition to have, have me removed or my house torn down. It might not look like much. But these men were skilled builders, both of them, it seems to me. No one pointed and laughed when they drove by this foolish man's house. Looked good from the outside. I'm sure that the floors were level, the walls were, were plumb, and the corners were square. The windows fit nicely, the doors fit, everything looked up to snuff. It was good, good looking house. So what this man What this, this says to us, many who know truth in theory, some even hold to the truth. They'll tell you so. But see, the question is, does the truth hold them? We are, we are standing on rock. If we are in Christ, we are being held by Christ. Yes, we hold to truth, 
We love the truth, but more than that, the truth holds us. But there are a lot of people who say they hold to the truth, but the truth is not holding them. They have a knowledge. They could wow you with their knowledge of the Bible. They may be gifted, they may be skilled, but they lack one thing essential, a foundation, a sure foundation for what they've built. And all such are built beautifully, maybe, and skillfully, but on sand. Another thing that is clear from this parable, both men persevered to finish their house. They didn't just start off. They, they completed the job. A foolish man, it would appear, was finished. His house was finished as completely as the wise man's house was. Apparently, they had both counted the cost. Jesus speaks of a building in another context, and he says, if you set out to build a tower, you want to first sit down and count the cost, see if you're able to finish it. And if you can't, don't start it. Don't get a tower half built. That brings shame upon you. So these had counted the cost, apparently, and both of them realized, they've, uh, they figure we can, I can do this. And so they did it. They built their houses. So we see how that this man's case seems to represent the fate of those in verse 22. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, look at my house. I finished this thing. It's good. And he will say, I never knew you. That house is on sand. It's not going to stand. It's not going to withstand the judgment. Now the, the rain and the, the floods and the wind, they can, these can represent the trials of this life. I'm not saying they do not. But I think that we also see, or we see primarily, that what it's going to be in the judgment, how God is going to see it, and what's going to happen then when they stand before God. That suits the context of these that come, to, they're standing before the Lord in judgment, pleading and arguing their case. Look at this beautiful house I built. Done so many wonderful things. I've added such a nice trim to it. We can be sure that many of these will have received a Christian burial, complete with high eulogies of the wonderful person that they were and all the Christian works that they had done. Probably several people come up and praise them, what good people they were. So let us all, therefore, examine ourselves. That's what Paul tells us to do. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Examine your foundation. Am I on Christ, or is my foundation something else? Is my foundation something that will not hold in the judgment? Is my foundation something that will not stand the storms of judgment? Judging upon appearance, the two men seemed not so different. Their buildings seemed not so different. And you know, appearance, judging on appearance. And incidentally, that is what most of these are looking for. That's what they want. That's what's most important to them, that they, their appearance is what it should be, that their appearance is good, that people say nice things about them, that people praise their faith. You know, in the chapter before, 
Jesus was talking about the hypocrites, those that were just play acting, assuming a character that really was not them. And what did they do? Well, they gave to be seen. They wanted people to see how much they were giving. And if it weren't for that, the accolades of men, they would not have been giving at all. They, they gave to be seen. They prayed. But why did they pray? So that men would hear them. Standing on the street corners saying long prayers. Oh my, isn't he religious? They would make themselves look gaunt so that it would appear that they had been fasting for day after day after day. And all of it was for appearance. They wanted to appear like they were very religious. And that's what the hypocrite is always concerned about. He wants the sepulcher whited, but inside it's dead men's bones. And that's the way what Jesus compares it to. The hypocrite does all of these things so that men will see him. It's a religion for show. And you can be sure that religion for show usually does not have a solid foundation. It's built on sand. Therefore, despite the similarities, these two men are poles apart. One is superficial. The other is substantial. One is pretentious. The other is sincere. One is a fool, and one is wise. False professors can make a fine show, but true believers are regenerated. True believers have a new heart. True believers, it's not just facade. It's not just superficial. There's something inside. And that holy walk is coming from a love for holiness. That righteous life is coming from a love for righteousness. The keeping of the law, the living an honest life, being a good neighbor, it's all coming from a love for truth and God's law. And that doesn't come without regeneration. You don't just grow into that. So with all of the similarities that there might be, there was a fatal flaw in the one. There was a great difference. He was not built on Christ. False professors can make a fine show, but two believers have a changed heart. And it's a heart that loves Christ and 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, Men look upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And these that are standing before Jesus, professing of all they've done, they impressed men, evidently. But he sees into the heart, I never knew you. You're not one of mine. So, Having compared the, the builders, I want us to see next the, the, the houses. Let's consider the houses that they built. Clearly, the house represents the man's religion, as I said at the beginning. Undoubtedly, one house went up much faster than the other one. When they were both finished, they probably looked much alike, but one of them went up really fast. Well, the other guy was barely had his flooring down, and this guy's house was all finished. Now, why did he finish so quickly? Well, I think it's obvious. Just think about all the laborious, time-consuming preparation that he didn't bother with. Luke six forty-eight says. Speaking of this very same parable, whosoever cometh to me and heareth these sayings of mine 
and doeth them. He is like a man who built his house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. But this foolish builder, he didn't dig deep. He didn't spend any time digging down. And while the wise man was digging, and you couldn't even see him because he was down below the ground, he was digging to get down to solid rock so that he could build his house on the solid rock. The other man had found him a nice smooth place, maybe brushed the sand around a little bit, and he started building. No dirty, sweaty, below ground work for this man. True religion requires digging deep. True faith in Christ, it requires repentance. There must be a deep sense of sin. It's not this hipsy hopping along, popping your bubble gum, yeah, I think I'll try Jesus. No, it is a sense of a great need. I am a sinner. I, have, I must have someone to get me out of the mess I'm in. I am a sinner. I have a deep sense of my sin. Anyone who speaks lightly of sin betrays a sandy foundation. Christians don't speak lightly of sin. They don't take it lightly. Repentance is a real thing. And it is something that, well, I'll just say it requires effort. It requires an effort that we can't, it requires a strength that we can't provide. Get up some morning and just say, I'm going to repent. You'll repent the Lord gives you repentance. You'll repent by the grace of God, in other words. And it'll take grace for you to repent. For you to turn from the sins you love and turn to Christ, leave those sins behind, that takes a work of grace. And that work comes as you sit under the ministry of the gospel, as you get into the word of God, and God begins to deal with your heart and deal with your sin. There is real faith in a real Savior. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's real, but there must be real commitment to the truth. There must be real holiness, not a superficial Cosmetic. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And you're not going to get through that straight gate and walk that narrow way with all the baggage of your sin. You just can't do it. There's got to be repentance. And so the man digging for the, down to the rock, he pictures one who has a deep sense of sin. He mo grieves over his sin. He cries out to God for repentance. He turns from his sin. And then he begins to walk with God, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sadly, most modern-day professions, most modern evangelism is aiming at a sudden show. It aims for a religious profession. I don't believe in pushing someone into making a profession of faith. The first time they show a little interest just get down and with them and kind of spoon feed them and, and get them to say a prayer, repeat a prayer that's not coming from their heart. They don't really understand. 
But modern evangelism, it's all about that. It's get a sudden show, a religious profession, and then start your list of do's and don'ts. And keep them, keep them on the straight and narrow. Well, the walk in the straight and narrow, I believe, is something that comes from within. It's a love for the straight and narrow. It's a love for the truth. And that's not to say that sudden conversions must necessarily be false. If I remember right, I believe the Apostle Paul was pretty suddenly converted. And it is possible. Certainly the Lord has done that. It seems like the first time the person heard the gospel, the Lord just did a work. But it doesn't usually happen that way. It's usually it's a bringing, a drawing one to Christ. We love to see the evidence that God is drawing, that God is working. Questions are being asked. You can know that the profession is coming It'll come to fruition as the Spirit of God brings it. But I don't believe in trying to coax it. Just encourage it. Encourage them to seek the Lord. Now the quickly built house would likely be more susceptible to structural damage from the storms, don't you think? The trials of life will test both the true and the false professor. The house on sand will understandably need more props and more cosmetic repairs to keep it keep the appearance up. More pretense, a little more pretense, a little more falsehood, a little more show. Another coat of paint. A little more caulking here in this crack. No, we got a in our life, we stand trials. And the true faith, it's not that we never get knocked off kelter. And I'm not even pretending to state anything like that. But we never get knocked off of the foundation. We do suffer the blows of life that come and sometimes not as we should. But these trials of life many times will bring that false profession to nothing. And sometimes that's a good thing because they truly then come to seek the truth. But sometimes it ends up in apostasy. And that is not a good thing. Jesus said to Judas, the original, the the apostate of all apostates. Yes, he walked with Jesus. He heard the same things the other disciples heard. He went out evangelizing two by two with them. He was right there. And when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, there was not a single one of those disciples he asked him to. Never pointed at Judas. He was built on the sand and his profession looked good to all of those around him. But Jesus saw into the heart, and he knew that he was a devil from the beginning. And he said, one of you is going to betray me. And it would be better for that man had he never been born. You know, and actually, it's, that can be said of anyone that goes out of this world without Christ. Been better had they never been born. But when Jesus says it, that way. When he states something like that, you know that it's serious business to make a profession of faith in Christ and then go back on it. To start off with Christ and then turn and walk no more with him and even betray him. It's a, it's a dangerous business, I'll just say that. The real test, we're going to be tested in this life. We need to be ready for that. Someone has said the rains represent, when the rains fall, that represents the, the 
the testings that come from God himself that he sends into our lives from heaven. Now, everything is ordained of God, but it seems like some of the testings, God just sends them down like drops of rain, pelting us. But then the floods seem to rep represent the persecutions that come from the world. These will sometimes toss us around. Do we feel the, the wind then blowing? That seems to be Satan himself and these mysterious things that come into our lives that we can't explain. But they have us, they sometimes or hopefully they have us on our knees. But these trials come, they come to both the false and the true. But the false, they'll get the better of them. It'll make that house start to shake and they can't get enough props and cosmetics to it to make it stand. Some will make it all the way to the judgment. And that's when the last props will be taken out and it'll fall. But the critical, vital difference between the two houses could not be discerned by human eye. The same is so regarding the true and the false when it comes to faith. The one true foundation is Christ. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a foundation stone, a precious cornerstone, a foundation. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed shall not make haste, shall not be confounded. Whosoever believes on him, a tried cornerstone. Now, that is the privilege of every believer to be fixed upon that foundation of Jesus Christ, a solid foundation, his truth, his doctrine, his righteousness. We stand on that foundation. We stand forever. And that great foundation stone is our security. But for those like these false professors that stumble at that stone, the Bible says it will grind them to powder. There's a big difference there. One of these houses is going to stand fixed upon the rock. The other is going to collapse like a giant stone fell on it because that's pretty much what happened. The one through foundations, Jesus Christ. So let us dig deep. Whatever you have to unearth and get rid of to get to Christ, you do that. And then you build upon that rock, Jesus Christ. All who are not resting on Christ, this foundation shall surely fall. The fall will be great, he says in verse 27. It will be crushing. Matthew 21, 44, the stone falls upon you, crushing. Surely this parable ought to press home the powerful words that went before it. The great, the exhortation that goes forth, this urgent exhortation, enter you in at the straight gate. It's that gate alone that leads to life. If you haven't entered in at the straight gate, then enter in by faith. By faith in Christ. Hear the warning. Beware of false teachers. Why? Well, they will fill you with false hopes. And they will steer you to the broad gate, the broad way and the wide gate, and not to Christ, who is the hope of sinners. Notice this sobering manner of fact. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. Not everyone. The fear, fearful preview of Judgment Day. 
for the foolish builder. This is it. Depart from me. I never knew you. I'll tell you something. If you're unsaved, if you will listen to what Jesus says when he holds out his hands and beckons and says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You will never hear these words. Depart from me. I never knew you. We need to build our houses on Jesus Christ, the solid rock. If you're not on Christ, then come. Come to Christ. Hear his call and cast yourself upon sovereign mercy. And you'll be his forever. You'll be united with him, as we heard earlier, in such a way that the two can never be separated. You know, if I'm in union with Christ, if you're in union with Christ, in order for me to perish, he would have to perish. No, we're secure in Christ. We have a solid foundation and nothing can shake it. Nothing can destroy the house that is built on this foundation.